and Gina. You're watching the Corvette Channel. Executive Director of Design, Global Chevrolet, Bill Zach. Thank you. I'll take that as you like what you see. Uh, <laughs> hey, at GM, every time we take on the task of designing a new Corvette, it must build on the storied history and push towards the future. Uh, the current 7th generation Corvette and each one before it had a strong and powerful presence. But the new, new mid-engine here eclipses anything that we've done before. This is not merely a new chapter in, in Corvette's legacy, this is an all new book. Chevrolet has always been about a symphony of performance, design, and engineering. But on this car, every element had to be elevated to the next level of craftsmanship. The Stingray's exterior is a powerful, bold, futuristic design expression with exotic proportions, a wider stance, but still unmistakably Corvette. You can see the continued influence of aircraft design, lean and muscular, with sculptor shapes, conveying a sense of motion, even while standing still. Now with the new cab forward driving position and rear engine location, the proportions become the essence of the jet fighter for the road. And as you would, and as you would expect, we maintain some of the essential Corvette design cues that are timeless and translated well to the new mid-engine configuration. You know, for example, the bold front face with the LED lights and aggressive dual element DRL signature proudly says Corvette. The strong fender piece over the front wheel and the rear quarter give the Corvette the expected athletic, muscular appearance. The sleek sculpture's low, taunt, and aero-driven. The horizontal crease on the body side is the main design element that gives Corvette its sleek appearance and anchors the fender shapes and aggressive side intake. Now the purity of this feature was so significant that we hit the door handle releases underneath the side intakes to keep it clean and uninterrupted. Now as you move around to the rear of the car, where most people will see the Corvette. <laughs> the dual element tail lamps are uniquely Corvette with an enhanced three-dimensional execution. With the wide lamp location and the lower dual exhaust tips, the rear stance exudes the performance of a true exotic. Now the design challenge for the mid-engine Corvette were unique in that everything had to be changed. But at the same time, our mission was to make the finished product not just unmistakably Corvette, but an exotic supercar version of a Corvette. By repositioning the engine to the middle, the proportions shift and the whole canopy is thrust forward in profile, allowing the rear wheels to move farther back for a much more aggressive attitude. The mid-engine design allows for a more forward feel in terms of driving position and visibility. You are actually leading the way as you drive. 
Additionally, having the motor behind you communicates a supercar feel, which intensifies the overall driving experience. The new location of the engine is truly the focal point for the car's design. It's the heart of this new Corvette, and it sits like a jewel in a showcase, visible through the large rear hatch window. Now, every visual surface and component has received unprecedented attention, including the meticulously designed engine and underhood compartment. In driving into the detailed execution of the car, the, the design team found inspiration and ideas in high-end motorcycles and race car components. We sought to optimize the appearance of every tube, component routing, fastener, and finish. We took the panels off and spent countless hours developing the engine compartment, right down to the mechanical fasteners. The intake manifold covers were completely redesigned, and a Corvette emblem was added for additional detail. Now the exterior statement is bold, fresh, and fully capable, reflecting what we have learned from past Corvettes and from racing. For the Stingray, we completely redesigned the cooling and airflow. We looked at drag, lift, and how to achieve the optimal balance with this new mid-engine configuration while maintaining the design integrity. All the surfaces are pulled as hot as possible over the mechanicals, giving the, giving the car a dynamic energy that visually draws people to it. Now what you see here on stage is the Z51 package. As you know, we've had this unique track package for Stingray in the past, and this one offers customers even more. As you can see, it has an aggressive front splitter and an open air rear spoiler. Our designers work hand in hand with the aero engineers, giving a whole new meaning to the term form follows function. And Tad will talk in detail more about the Z51 a little bit later. Now the mint engine, mint engine configuration not only enables a stunning exterior, but also provides interior accommodations which are improved. With the engine behind the driver, the cowl and the instrument panel are lowered. And the entire occupant package is moved forward 16 and a half inches, improving visibility. The driver compartment is also larger than the previous generation, offering more space and an inch more seat travel. With this new mid-engine exotic exterior, we had to deliver an inspiring interior to match. Most important is the driver-centric cockpit which features a new, squared-off, two-spoke steering wheel that leaves an unobstructed view of the 12-inch reconfigurable cluster display. The, steering, the square steering wheel shape and low two-spoke configuration enable a full 9 and 3 o'clock hand grip during hard cornering, so you'll have the optimal position. The compressed shape also allows for better visibility and more legroom. In the cockpit, the controls are literally wrapped around you in all directions. It reflects a car that is all about catering to the driver's experience. You'll also notice that the only knob on the audio system is the volume control because it's the one that's most frequently used. Every other button on the system had to earn its place. And the single line of climate control buttons on the console laid out, they're all laid out and minimized. The instrument panel's wings extend from the driver's console and wrap around the IP, freeing up space. This less is more philosophy has also been incorporated into the unique ultra thin air vents. The look is simple and clean and help us keep the instrument panel low for great forward visibility. <clears throat> now we'll be offering three seat options, a GT1, a GT2, and a competition sport for drivers seeking the right balance of comfort and style. We now offer six interior color themes, more than ever before, which also includes more personal choices on material selection and stitching. The interior stitching is also larger and more pronounced, highlighting the handcrafted quality and attention to detail. Even the seat belts get an expanded, expressive color palette in option number six. And we've also expanded the exterior color palette to 12, more than we've ever offered previously. One of the key things as well is everything on the interior is authentic and most parts are wrapped in leather or suede. The buttons are aluminum, carbon fiber is used throughout for lightweight performance and visual appeal. Now all of these details are what makes this 2020 mid-engine Stingray special. From the moment a customer walks up to the car and opens the door, we want to surprise them. 
and let them discover something they weren't expecting. We want them to say this can only be a Corvette, but also say that this feels like no other Corvette ever. Now, none of this great design would be much without the performance, the packaging, and the total livability of this mid-engine sports car. So this was all made possible by the incredible engineering team led by Corvette Executive Chief Engineer, Tad Stricter. Tad? Thank you. They didn't let my, me bring my bottle up last, last night, but I'm bringing it up this time. <laughs> so we, what'd you say? It's not raining. Yeah, we, we won't have that happening today. Um, so we've given this presentation quite a number of times. Uh, we've given it to the dealers and the media, and we even had uh, Wall Street investment bankers in this morning, uh, celebrities, you name it. But this is our favorite audience right here. You guys. So how many of you watch the live stream, either live or almost live? So you recognize some of what Phil said, right? <laughs> it was very familiar, and uh, the only way we can keep doing this is to run the scripts that we already have and the video that we already have, um, so you're going to get a flavor of it. So I'll follow along the script so the video works, but I may deviate here and there uh, where it might be interesting or new uh, for you guys. So anyway. We knew this was the right time uh, to move to mid-engine. We've actually known it uh, for a while. We've been reaching the limits. Through C6 and through C7, uh, we were increasingly convinced that we weren't going to be able to just keep staying the course with the front engine design. And of course, expanding the performance envelope was one challenge. We could have done that a long time ago. Zora wanted to do it. You know, he went on to do one of those experimental cars out there, screw everything else, Let's just get performance, put the engine in the back, and just make it the fastest car possible. But the Corvette also has to be beautiful, functional, and attainable. When he was making, when Zora was making his arguments to leadership, he was actually arguing for a cost is no object car. It's like, he wanted, just give me the checkbook, let me go do it, it'll be the best sports car ever, it'll make GM proud, um, and he got pushed back slammed into his place. No, this is a business. We're selling 40000 a year. What don't you understand about that? We're going to stay the course. So our task was not just to do that mid-engine car, but mid-engine plus everything else. We had to develop a new sports car that combines all the things that you guys appreciate about the car today and add the performance and excitement of a mid-engine supercar. And we always want to meet requirements all around the world. I did a very subtle announcement last night. I said, meet those requirements, including right-hand drive, and it seemed like there was dead silence in the room. It's hard to hear, actually, from here, but it would seem like dead silence, and so I had to tell them that. That was news, folks. That was huge. <laughs> and I'm sure all the people in Australia raised the beer, and it's like, they're coming. They're coming to the Southern Hemisphere. Yep. So, uh, that was, that was fun to be able to, to do that. And one of the reasons we're doing it, you haven't seen any spy shots, but you will uh, pretty soon here. It's very hard to camouflage a steering wheel on the right hand side. <laughs> we had this uh, brainstorm of putting a steering wheel on both sides, <laughs> but we didn't think that would work very well either. So you can't camo that. Uh, we're going to start working on a right hand drive car. And so I'm sure that people will be blowing up the first time they see a spy shot of a, a right-hand drive car. So, you know, the big challenge is we didn't want to do uh, this mid-engine car and let you down in any way. So it had to be everything we do well today and step it up from there, and we had to execute that perfectly on our first try. So I showed last... This is something we've stressed about for many, many years. How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna get all the answers we need, not stub our toe on everything, and get all the answers? So 
you know, we spent a lot of time working on our computer models, getting them up to speed. Uh, they, we wanted to synthesize and integrate all the solutions for body structure and aero and thermal management, crashworthiness, crashworthiness is a whole different deal when you put the engine in the back. Uh, so that includes a bunch of challenges in itself, and so um, and a bunch more stuff than that. We showed a bunch of images, you can see some of them back here, of some of that simulation work. And um, I don't know, if we're, I think we're just going to show a video of some of the augmented reality that we showed um, last night. But I got a lot of feedback that people thought that was really, really a cool way to, to show stuff. So I talked about the physics, about why putting the engine behind the driver lets us make this big, giant leap. And we wanted to make sure that we didn't just put the engine in the back. We wanted to figure out how do you leverage that to maximum advantage to make sure you really get that quantum leap. So it kind of starts with the steering. That's your main interface with the car. Um, I talked last night about the very short, straight, stiff steering system. It makes the... Uh, I think it's 50% stiffer than today's car, and it means when you move the wheel, the front moves over immediately. The turn in on this car is incredible. The fact that you're sitting so far forward, uh, I said last night you sit basically on top of the car center of gravity. You actually sit slightly forward of the center of gravity. So when you turn into a turn, the car rotates right around you, and you actually ride that front axle in, and you're moving in the same direction uh, of the car. And that completely changes the perception of the vehicle handling. Even some of us that were skeptical uh, early on that we would get that are total believers now. We spent a lot of time going back and forth between the cars. No disrespect for today's car, it's awesome, um, but we've really accomplished something with this. So the thing that surprised us, one of us things that I mentioned last night also was uh, we were surprised at how we could use things like higher spring, spring, excuse me, spring rates um, tie down the dampers more and actually get better ride quality. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that you're sitting right on that center of gravity. And so whether the car is rotating in the plan view in a turn or in the side view, when you're sitting on that center of gravity, the ends of the car could be moving all over the place, hitting a pothole or whatever, and you don't feel it. So we can actually tie the car down more and still have great uh, ride quality. The other thing that I was paranoid, honestly, from the beginning. I grew up in a Porsche family, actually. Um, my dad had Porsches, so I knew about trailing throttle oversteer, and so I was a little bit paranoid. Okay, we'll put all this weight in the bag. GM doesn't have a lot of expertise on this. How are we going to make sure that the car handles really benignly, really progressively? So this was a mission uh, we took on from early on. Try to figure this out. Make sure everything we thought might have some something to do with that kind of handling, even with this weight distribution, we studied that intently. We built early mules and things to validate our uh, engineering assumptions. So the bottom line is we really want to take advantage of everything that's good about having that much weight on the back, but none of the drawbacks, none of the things we were uh, afraid of. So, you know, we did tons of work on the suspension, geometry, pushing compliances, tire construction. We have the biggest stagger front to rear that we've ever had, 245 in the front, 305 in the back, um, and then worked all the little details, uh, and it, the car really came together kind of at the, at the very last, that last end. It's actually still being worked because we're not quite done yet, we're, we're getting close, and we know and we say confidently, and that's why we're saying it publicly, uh, the final result is, is it's magic. It's incredible the way the car handles. It's better than we thought we'd be. We knew we could probably be pretty good, but it's actually better than we thought. Um, today's car, like I said, is completely awesome uh, in a lot of ways, but when you go back to back, you can really appreciate uh, the difference. It really does feel super comfortable, super nimble, and it never puts a foot wrong. It feels really, really stable. So the body structure is an interesting thing because we actually cut our teeth on aluminum structures way back in the C6 days, starting with the Z06, and then we made that aluminum structure standard, brought it in-house, built in Bowling Green, and so we did a lot of technical learnings on aluminum and bonded on composite body structures on a front engine car. So we kind of took that level of risk and challenge off the table, put it in production on the C7, so that was a huge learning step going forward uh, to doing this all-new car. We kind of had a lot of that understood in what we needed to do. 
One of the things we learned is that you really need premium aluminum construction. So you don't want uh, a construction made of a thousand tiny little pieces. And if you look at some of the exotics, the cheapest way to make aluminum parts is extrude them. So you extrude parts, you cut them, and you weld them together. And so you end up with this jigsaw puzzle that's mostly consisting of weld. It's a bunch of joints. Uh, it's a low-cost way to do it, but it's not the best technical way to do it. We knew that the best way to do it was to use high-pressure die castings. And I, I talked about it last night. Uh, we designed the car, developed it with some of the biggest die castings in the world. Six of them, and you can see them in the animation, take up huge chunks of the body structure, which means no joints, no welding. When you weld on material, it gets weaker and uncertain uh, as to what the material properties are. The car is almost all glued and screwed together, so structural adhesive and redundant mechanical fasteners, very dimensionally uh, capable and uh, super stiff. But the key was getting to uh, these large castings. And when we went to actually go out and source these castings, nobody wanted to do it. There's nobody in the world who wanted to build castings this large to our requirements at the volumes we planned to sell this car. And so we had to do it ourselves. We actually had to insource. We had to go to the leadership of the company and say, this is an important business for us. Nobody else is going to do it. We have to do it ourselves. And so that's an example of something that we, we really decided to vertically integrate make that capability part of GM's capability, and we ended up buying all the raw equipment and learning how to do this, and we actually installed it in Bedford, Indiana, in a plant that makes blocks, aluminum block castings, head castings, things like that, and now they've extended their cap capability into high pressure die castings. It's great for us, and it's a great learning for General Motors, because you'll end up seeing us be able to have that capability in other kinds of cars. Like I said, uh, when you have castings that big, you don't have any joints, that makes the car super robust <coughs> in all the crash uh, situations and lets us tailor the materials to a very fine degree. You can cast these, uh, these parts to very thin walls. You put all the material exactly uh, where it needs to be for maximum stiffness and minimum mass. And as we all know, and every time we do a new Corvette, we preach this, the stiffer the body structure, the better the suspension can work and the better the vehicle handling. Now we've done open air cars uh, exclusively uh, since the C4 uh, with a removable roof and we wanted to keep that up. So we have used this backbone structure strategy since 1997 with the C5. Uh, but you can't just take that and apply it directly uh, to a mid-engine car. The, the paths that get the structure to that center backbone and away from it back to the shock towers <coughs> very, very different. The engine in the back is right in the way. The front wheels are tucked forward right under your dead pedal. So there's not a good way to route structure the way we've done historically. So we had to completely redefine the way we use that uh, architectural backbone. And it's uh, made this the Corvette, the stiffest Corvette uh, we've ever done uh, by quite a good margin and substantially stiffer than other uh, convertible mid-engines we benchmarked against. So you'll notice that great structural feel, but one of the advantages of that center backbone is a lot of mid-engine cars have very high rockers because they use these big tubs for the center section. And so uh, we put all our structure right down the center line. So the step over height is similar to, see how good I get in that thing? It's like, no, I'm old. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to get in and out of. So the, the, the rocker height is similar to what you've had on Corvette and uh, it's better than a lot of uh, kind of exotic mid-engine. Cars. Uh, as is typical for Corvette, uh, we don't say we're going to make everything out of one thing or another. We've been a composite-based car since 1953, and so we let the parts tell us what they should be made out of. And so we use aluminum for the base structure, but we use innovative materials uh, throughout the, the vehicle, making up a, a mosaic. And some of our displays back here showcase uh, some of those all, all of those materials. So uh, I talked a lot about last night about luggage capacity, and uh, you know, I doubt there's ever been a high-performance sports car presentation where they spend so much time on luggage capacity. But <laughs> we really wanted to make sure that we kept the utility that people had and gotten used to. So as we talked about last night, we have both a front storage and a rear storage compartment. And those big components we make out of this new super ultra lightweight uh, uh, fiberglass 
very lightweight fiberglass, uh, proprietary resin uh, from one of our suppliers. Um, and it's so light, we actually have bricks of it back here shaped like uh, what we call a speed shape. So you can actually pick it up. And you can feel how light it is compared to other composite materials, magnesium, aluminum, steel. You can actually feel the density. And this is the first time we've had these structural composites that are so light they'll actually float in water. Even a solid brick of it will, will float in water, which is it's pretty amazing. And it's, it's a place where we're just advancing. You know, when you first look at the car, you might not appreciate that that's a true advancement. It's under the skin, but it's uh, a true advancement that lets us just keep constantly at the state of the art uh, for these exotic materials. So speaking of the luggage compartments, uh, we knew this would be important. Obviously, we spend a lot of time with you at Corvette events. You see how you fill the back end of today's car. You want to bring all this stuff uh, with you. We started spoiling you with the C5, where you could put tons of stuff in the back. And we wanted to do as good a job as we could uh, getting you all that uh, luggage space. So that was one of the tricky things we had to solve, is how, how do we put luggage space and put room for all the other componentry we're part of a modern car and a mid-engine car. Uh, it's a very different formula than what we've had um, ever before. So we're pretty proud of the luggage volume. In fact, if you took the luggage compartments and you just filled them with water, it holds the same. The shapes are different, but the, the volumes are about the same. And I mentioned last night the five-piece luggage set that we custom designed as an accessory that fits uh, in this car also. And another material that we have an example of back here is the automotive world's first curved, pultruded carbon fiber bumper beam. So on the, the seventh generation car, we put our, our premium materials in the front and up high. So the hood was carbon fiber, the roof was carbon fiber. In this car, car, we really want to take weight off the back. So it's completely the opposite problem. So instead of having the battery in the back, we move it to the front to try to move the weight distribution forward a little bit. And on the very, very trailing edge of the car, we have this protruded carbon. You can back and feel it up. Even compared to aluminum, which is a premium material, it's much, much uh, lighter. So we're very proud of, uh, of the luggage volume that we've accomplished. and look forward to you guys being able to use this car in all the ways uh, that you use it now. Super important that we keep that, that bandwidth, you know, not just pure track machine, but great daily driver, great long distance tour. I know a lot of people do that, I do that. Uh, want to make sure that you can travel in comfort and style and bring all your stuff with you. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, part of the lifestyle uh, of, of owning a Corvette. So um, we're also bringing back more customizability uh, than ever. We have the modes that you've kind of gotten used to, weather, tour, sport, and track but we have actually more knobs to turn to make those more different, more customizable. Um, so the car changes character more, again, more bandwidth. And then we introduced last night that we have this Z mode that gives you one button access to everything you can vary in the car. So stuff you've never been able to change before, uh, you can adjust and make exactly to your uh, own specification and it's there for you anytime you want to hit the button. Now, if you choose never to do that, and you just leave it in the factory defaults, it doesn't do nothing. It gives you like a super sport kind of mode. It's like halfway between sport and track. So it, it, it livens the car up at a press of a button. And I, I bet a lot of people will never change it. They'll just like that kind of super sport uh, mode. But if you want to make it completely your own, uh, you can do that. Of course, we have Z51 track package coming back. Um, it's even more important now. Uh, We've talked about it, but we didn't even mention it last night. We were so compressed for time last night. Uh, but we actually, uh, the standard car comes with all-season tires. It's Michelin's highest performance ever all-season tire. So it's truly a sports car tire. Corners at about 1G, and it's a four-season tire. Uh, it rides really good. Uh, it's an exceptional, uh, kind of a new age tire. And uh, I can remember it back in the C4 days when we first approached 1G cornering and it took a rock hard suspension, an ox cart ride, the car was just brutal to try to get to 1G. Now we do it in the comfort of a standard suspension with all season tires. It's amazing how far technology has come. So that's the standard. Then the Z51 has summer performance tires and because the architecture itself is so capable, we're actually able to back away a little from the intensity, the exotic nature of the tires. So you know how in today's car, when it chatters, when it's cold, because when the tires are cold, they have a different stick-slip phenomenon, gone. 
that is gone. So, and you wouldn't think, okay, mid-engine versus front engine, would that even, why would that have anything to do with that? Well, it does. And uh, we don't have to lean on the tires quite as hard. They can be better, more progressive, more well-rounded, and still get all the performance. This car's faster. Trust me, this car's faster uh, on a track. Uh, in every situation uh, than the current uh, Stingray Z51. So in addition to that, of course, you get larger brakes. Uh, the ELSD, uh, which has been super effective, uh, made famous actually, on the seventh generation car. You get more cooling in the aero. This is a Z51 car here, so you get the splitter and uh, this rear spoiler. Uh, and the Z51 actually creates full vehicle downforce. Um, which the current Stingray Z51 does not. So it's 400 pounds of downforce at 180 miles an hour, and uh, it makes the car super stable uh, on the track. In addition to the chassis, I was talking about this car. It's such a quick learn. It's, it's amazing. It's going to be a great. I was telling Ron Fellows he was here last night. I was like, this is going to be such an awesome school car. Everybody's going to be a hero as soon as they get in it. Uh, they're just going to love it. The ELSD, because you have more weight on the back, it's actually uh, more effective than ever. It has more authority over the vehicle dynamics. Uh, so we're really able to leverage that tool to a degree that we have never done before. It makes the car super stable in corners and you put the power down uh, really early. Uh, PTM uh, has been refined, we invented PTM. Now you find it on, uh, on other cars. Uh, we've made it uh, more consistent across a wider range of conditions. We also have a new electrical architecture. It's uh, it's much faster, sends the signals faster, actually gives us the capability to do a lot of things kind of in higher resolution than we've ever done before. And cybersecurity, you hear about it, but until it affects you, you don't think much of it. But someday there's going to be a cybersecurity attack on a, a vehicle. And when that happens, it's, I don't think it's going to be a GM car because we have this new cybersecurity uh, electronic uh, architecture, and then all of a sudden it's going to be super important. Everybody's going to uh, be super worried about what, how secure is my car. And then over the air reflash capability. Every time we introduce a new Corvette and a new feature, a new this or a new that, first hand goes up. Can I get that on my car? Last year's car? Everybody wants backwards compatibility. And we can't always do it, but now we have the capability of actually doing calibration changes, continuous improvements, things like that can be done over the air. So a huge benefit for you guys. How many people have used the performance data recorder? So we kind of invented that, pioneered that, and we're bringing out the second generation now which has uh, 1080p uh, recording, um, and we're starting with a database of track start finish lines. So for most tracks, you won't even have to program them in. And then we had a lot of customer requests for point-to-point -point recording. So in autocross, for example, where you don't end at the same place you start, um, that was a request, and so we work with Cosworth uh, to, to do that. And then uh, the Cosworth toolkit that will come out uh, with it, will also be significantly enhanced uh, from today. And then a lot of people said, why can't I just act, you know, make it act like a dash thing? And we're uh, offering that as well, that it'll just start up and record whenever you're driving. You will overwrite, you don't have to hit a button. You can prove you were right at the scene of the accident. <laughs> or wrong. Very nice. So uh, other features we have is the Bose Audio. We have a demo back here. You can actually uh, listen to it if you want. Uh, one of the coolest features is this uh, camera rear view mirror. Once you get used to it, you can't go back. It's a very high resolution uh, picture. You can go back and forth. It can be a conventional mirror or a digital mirror. And there's a lot of lighting conditions where the camera can see better than your eye can. Uh, and we mount the camera that drives it on the roof of the car so it's forward and high. And that means you get a great view of your blind zones. You can zoom it in if you want so you can see if the car way behind you has a light bar on it or go wide angle. <laughs> Corners, you know, seeing your blind zones, um, or any use case you could think of. So uh, the biggest applause line last night was our front lift system. So uh, this is 
especially appropriate for mid-engine cars because the front tires come back. The front overhang is typically longer. Ours is a little bit longer. We try to keep it at a minimum. But the ramp angles, if you've got a steep driveway, this is going to be wonderful. Up to two inches increase, thousand locations in memory. And it's even smarter to know that you're approaching a, a bump fast or slow. If you're approaching slow, it'll wait till the last minute to lift it up. If you're approaching fast, you'll say, uh oh. You know, it'll, it'll pick it up, start picking it up earlier. Saying you're, you're not paying attention to what you're doing, it'll start picking it up earlier. So, really cool feature, and I, everybody quickly appreciated that one. Uh, we have an engine uh, demo uh, here, and if you want to go look at it, you can talk to Jordan Lee. He's our chief engineer uh, for the engine. Uh, we work hand in hand on every Corvette, uh, optimizing the performance of the small block. Everybody seemed really happy last night that we were going, weren't going to a small V6 turbo or, God help us, a four-cylinder turbo. <laughs> um, staying with a naturally aspirated V8. So we're sort of bucking the trend, bucking the powers that be of what people would like us to do. Uh, but we try to listen to you rather than uh, other people. So we're very happy that's coming back. Almost 500 horsepower. Uh, the new dry sump system is, I talked about it last night, you can see the display here. It's been completely bulletproof on the track. Uh, the engines have been super reliable. So that's one thing we're really happy to have. And it's a nice touching point for people who think, oh my God, they're changing too much stuff with this mid-engine. Well, there's the small block sitting right in the heart of the car. Very familiar. And it's really cool to hear it. You'll recognize the exhaust sound uh, immediately. And it's really cool to hear that engine coming from behind you. It's very, very, very fun. So we can skip past the rest of the engine stuff, uh, get on to um, the uh, DCT. So one of the, when people started putting DCTs in production, one of the questions we got asked all the time was, when are you gonna have a DCT? Even when people didn't even know what a DCT was. Like, when are you gonna have a DCT? And so, um, you know, it's based on the media reports. And there's good things about DCTs and bad things about DCTs. And uh, the DCTs are, can be wonderful, but to do everything well, to, to have that real crisp, engaging, mechanical shift quality, immediacy on the paddle, and have it be a perfectly smooth, automatic type transmission is a big challenge. Uh, we worked with our supplier of the car manual transmission, Tremec, and we designed one from scratch for this car. Completely blank sheet of paper, and it meets our requirements. There, there was nothing in the world that would it would stand up behind this new motor and fit in this architecture. Uh, we slammed it down to the ground. It really needed to be compact so we could have the rear uh, luggage volume. So we had to do a DCT ourselves. And the net result, uh, partly because of the electrical architecture, the super fast response times, this thing works exactly like you would dream it could. It's, uh, it's really, really wonderful. Uh, very engaging and has a lot of features that can be operated like a uh, manual transmission. So if you're a manual fan, uh, you'll find a lot to like. It's not exactly the same as a manual, uh, but there's a lot to like about this transmission. You know, we set it up at eight speeds, first gear, gets you out of the hole unbelievably quickly. It comes off the line harder than any car we've ever done. Uh, we set up two through six to, for track work, so it keeps the engine on the power peak uh, on any track in the world. And then, uh, like a Corvette tradition, you shift it up in the seventh or eighth, and the car can be quiet, and the engine runs slow, and you get good fuel economy, good range. Um, or if you put it in track mode or pump up the exhaust, you can have the nice verbal as you motor down the road. And I think one of the biggest drop the mic nights, uh, drop the mic uh, episodes last night was when we announced zero to 60 under three seconds. I think that came as a little bit of a surprise. That's the combination. This engine, the torque curve, the area under the torque curve, the way we set up the, the transmission, the rear weight bias, this car gets off the line like crazy, zero to 60 under three seconds. So um, we're pretty, pretty darn proud of that. That's one of the few uh, true performance metrics we shared last night, and uh, there'll be more coming. So we're saving some more for later. So we'll keep, keep the pot boiling uh, with more news. There's lots of technical stories that we haven't covered yet uh, on this car, but more will be coming out. Keep you guys entertained until you can get yours. So 
Um, I'm curious, show of hands, how many people, you know, I, I sort of wrapped it up last night saying, you know, we've done all these changes to the car, but the bottom line, you know, it's a uh, two passenger, road going private jet, you know, that'll take you anywhere you want to go. Uh, how many of you guys are buying that? Are you guys think it's okay? How many people think it's definitely the wrong thing? Nobody's willing to. Oh, we got one over here. I'll talk to you after. <laughs> wait till you drive it. Wait, wait till you drive it. <laughs> so anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed what Phil and I uh, had presented. We tried to put a little bit of different spin on what you saw last night. And like I said, you guys are our favorite audience. Uh, we're glad you came out. And please check out the rest of the stuff we have to show to you. Thanks. Thank you for watching the Corvette channel. If you like what you saw today, please hit subscribe and hit the like button. Also, be sure to hit that bell so you will be alerted to our next uploads.